Well, welcome back, everybody, Bio2 students. Today, we're going to talk about the phylum Onychophora and the Arthropoda. Come on, there we go. All right, anyway, so the first group uh, that we'll talk about today is the phylum Onychophora that you see right here. And these are called the walking worms. And quite a long time ago, uh, probably, I'm going to guess in the 80s and before, the Onychophora, uh, the walking worms as they're called, were thought to be this missing fossil link between annelid worms and arthropoda. They have some characteristics that are similar between the two groups. But you might remember last week um, in lecture, I was talking about my buddy, uh, Doug Ernesty from Cal State Fullerton, who's the world famous um, Polly Placophore and Chitin guy. He wrote a famous paper among that group of people um, that the arthropods and annelids are not sister taxa. And I think that's actually the paper that kind of made him kind of famous in the uh, biology community, as famous as you can be. Um, in the in that kind of world um more famous than me for sure uh not kobe bryant famous or anything like that but but as far as a biologist goes uh that was the paper i think that uh sort of brought him to the next level anyway turns out uh doug ernesty and the rest of the community said they're not sister taxa um, and so this isn't the missing link it's just its own group anyway unjointed appendages, but they do have a segmented body. Um, and I think it was the molecular data that they ended up using that kind of put it uh, in its own spot. Okay, so that's the Onychophora. Uh, then we have the phylum Tardigrata. And uh, these are really interesting animals. They're, they're called uh, tardigrades, or they're also called water bears. And they're, they're studied in, in all kinds of extreme environment scenarios. They're probably the toughest animals in the world, they can uh, you can freeze them down below minus 300 degrees, and you can heat them in an oven over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and they survive that. Uh, their name Tardigrata means slow stepper, and they can survive all kinds of you know not just heat but pressure. They can go many many years without food and without water, and they can uh, they can. Um, go through desiccation and dry out. Um, and they go through a stage, they, they call it cryptobiosis, where they kind of fold up into a ball, sort of like a roly-poly. And in that little condition, uh, they can survive like almost anything, which is kind of interesting. You'll learn more about them in lab. Uh, I say roly-poly, um, and, and that's a, also called a pill bug or a sow bug. That's the little thing that walks around that every kid plays with. This is a uh, an electron microscope picture. So they, they, they're they much, much smaller than a roly-poly um, or a sow bug. Um, these are microscopic in size, but they can sort of fold up and survive those conditions. Um, we already talked about the phylum nematoda. Uh, those are the nematode worms. We talked about those last time. And um, I have this slide in here, uh, mainly because in some... Uh, depending on how you do the taxonomy, if you're doing it molecularly or if you're doing the taxonomy based on uh, characteristics, the nematode worms and other things, they fit in different spots. Um, and one's not necessarily more correct than the other that we know about yet. So I'm sticking to a general scheme and just giving you one scenario of it uh, just to make your life easier. Your life's hard enough as it is, I think, right? Okay, so, and it's about to get hard anyway, as we do the phylum arthropoda. So the phylum arthropoda are the jointed foot animals, arthro, like arthritis, poda foot. And uh, it's a huge group. It's the biggest group by far in terms of things that are named. So they have a hard exoskeleton and a segmented body. Uh, they have paired appendages, usually they're bilaterally symmetrical like this lobster, where um, again, bilateral means you can cut it in one spot where you have a right and left. Um, whereas in radial symmetry, you can cut it in one spot and have a right or left, but you can turn 
the angle and cut it and still have a right or left. So a, a, a bicycle wheel or a tire in a car is generally, depending on what rims you buy, you know, if you spend, I'm making these numbers up now, but if you drive a crummy $500 1981 Honda Civic and you put $5,000 rims on it, um, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, if you take the rim, assuming it's sort of round and has similar parts, there might be different ways you could divide that where you have a right or left um, at multiple planes. That's, that is a radially symmetrical surface. So these are bilaterally symmetrical. And uh, they have an open circulatory system. They're generally fairly small. Some of them get pretty big like lobsters, but most of them are fairly small. Uh, they have a nervous system very similar to annelids. Um, and about 80% of all the species identified are in this group. So we currently have over one, um, we have about 1.3, uh, I think, 1.3, 1.4 million identified species and around 80% of those. So about a million species of arthropods. Um, so it is the by far and large, the biggest group and taxonomically it is the largest group uh, and has lots of subcategories. So if you don't like taxonomy, this is going to be a part you don't like uh, taxonomy wise. Now, uh, let me point out that um, I say 80% of all identified species and over a million, which is true. Um, but keep in mind that, that part of that is because we've been naming and classifying arthropods for a very long time since the 1700s. And a lot of these are things like beetles that you can see um, with the naked eye or, or with a, a minimal level microscope. You know, so so we've been doing that a long time. Things like bacteria and nematode worms, um, there are less identified species of those. But in reality, if you really were to, if we ever identify every species on the planet, bacteria, nematode worms, and lots of things, I'm sure are going to outdo the number of arthropods. Um, but currently, based on where it stands, um, there are more identified arthropod species than anything else. Although I doubt that is true um, in reality in terms of what's out there. Okay, so that's the arthropods. Now, there's a great deal of diversity with the arthropods um, and people have wondered why. Uh, one of the big things is they have this very versatile exoskeleton. So unlike us that has an internal skeleton, their shell, their outside um, body is the skeleton um, and they have segments and appendages in there and so what they do is like on an arthropod let's say you had an arthropod leg um, and that's one part of the leg and that's another part of the leg and they're hard on the outside the muscles are inside like that and so this can bend at this point um, because the muscles can contract and pull on those hard outside parts. Um, they're segmented. Um, that allows the exoskeleton to have gaps in it to where you can have the muscles and, and move, and they have appendages that stick off that. Um, I'll talk about the trachea system in a little bit because it depends on the which species, but, but they have this very advanced um, respiratory system in, and, and they're able to, depending on the animal, deliver oxygen to individual areas of the body or cells. It's, it's more, based on their size, since they're small, it's, it's far more efficient than a kind of respiratory system that we have. So we'll talk about that when we get to insects a little bit. They have highly developed sense organs. Uh, many of them have very good vision. Uh, many of them are very fast and have quick operating nervous systems. Uh, many of them have very good uh, sense of chemoreception, sense of smell or detecting other molecules or touch. Depends again on the arthropod. Many complex behavior patterns we'll talk about. And many of them go through 
some type of metamorphosis where they change. The best example um, for you to probably think about when we talk about this is like a butterfly starts off um, as a caterpillar and then changes into a butterfly over time. That is a type of metamorphosis, but there are many, and we'll talk about those. So let's get into the classification because that's the beast uh, that's in front of us now. So first of all, we have the phylum Arthropoda at the top. And then I don't, th I don't think we've done this yet, but, um, you have kingdom phylum class like you've had before, but when you have so many species, it becomes harder to, uh, have enough room for those groupings. So they do things like have subphyla. So we have phylum and then right below phylum, is subphylum and subphylum is below phylum but it's higher than class okay so we have subphylum trilobita subphylum then chelicerophormes and then under chelicerophormes for example we have several classes which we'll go into um, and then we have subphylum crustacea uh, and we have classes under those and then subphylum hexapoda um, and then there's even more groupings under those. If you look at the lab, you'll see um, an overwhelming number of taxonomic uh, terms. And we'll go into more of those in lab. So let's go through these first of all. Start with the phylum Trilobita. Um, they're all extinct, this subphylum. Uh, they date back to the Permian era 250 million years ago. Um, so a long time ago. Um, one of the first larger animals um, probably on the planet, lots and lots of fossils of them. Um, they lived in aquatic environments. They look like this. Um, and they have a segmented body without specialization and paired appendages. If you go to, um, the fair or novelty shops or that kind of thing, as you're walking around and you're shopping at places every now and then you can find a place that will sell fossil trilobites. Um, and you can look at them and see that they're embedded in the rock and you can buy this uh, trilobite for, you know, whatever, $20, $30, wh whatever it's going for. Kind of depends on how big it is and the shape and that kind of thing. So there are fossils you can buy in stores. But I was at the fair one time and they had some trilobites. I was looking, that was kind of neat. But then they had dinosaurs. They had like um, these miniature dinosaur fossils that they were selling for $700 or $800. And I found it very suspicious. I asked them, are these real fossils? And they're like, yeah, that's the real fossil. So you can kind of get ripped off because there's no way that you have a real articulated fossil skeleton of a dinosaur and you got nine of them and you're selling them for $700 a piece. So they can make casts of them and sell you uh, a replica and I was kind of miffed because they were they were essentially they were a lot it was fraud you know and I asked them and they're like yeah it's a real dinosaur no way so you got to be careful out there trilobites is it a real trilobite you're buying probably so I mean you could um, you could probably fake that too but you just got to be careful it's one of those things like when am I ever going to use that well there I was at the fair using it. Um, there's a neat little thing on Facebook. They're showing uh, exponential growth. Um, and they're and the students are like, when am I going to ever use that? Well, COVID-19 and the exponential growth chart. And because we're not smart enough to understand exponential growth, we don't get it. So there you go. You're only not going to use it if you're not going to use it. Maybe you could use it. All right. Next is subphylum Chelicera Formies, and just like the name says, chelicera, these animals have chelicera. So they have six pairs of appendages, one pair of chelicera, which we'll get into later on. Those are modified in spiders we'll talk about. They have one pair of pedipalps. Uh, pedipalps are like a, like a mouth part, and we'll go into those later on as well. The only exception in the chelicera formies where they don't have the pedipalps is the horseshoe crab, which we'll go into in, in just a second here. And they have four pairs of walking legs for the most part. Okay. So if you think about things like spiders and scorpions, 
uh, which are arachnids, and we'll go into that in a minute. They have four pairs of walking legs. They have eight legs, okay? Insects don't. Insects have six legs. Six. I did this. This is when I'm talking with my hand, and that's the number six. So there you go. Got to be careful, right? Since it's a video, I have to be conscious and, and correct myself. So in lecture, when I'm talking, um, I always tell you uh, whatever I'm thinking, whether it comes out of my mouth or not, right? You know, it's what I was thinking. And you can stop me and and here it's harder. So I have to I have to stop myself, which is not good because I have to multitask. And you know I can't multitask. But anyway, four pairs of walking legs, uh, and no mandibles. Mandibles are chewing mouth parts, um, like your mandible. Um, your mandible is a part of your mouth and, and this is derived from a different structure, but, um, they have no mandibles in the Chelicerformes. And again, we'll see those in other animals as we go up. Okay. And they have no antenna. If you think about a grasshopper or a butterfly, uh, they have antenna that stick out of their head that are used for sensing the environment or ants or bees. Um, but the Chelicerformes have no antenna. Okay. So first we have the class Meristomata. So remember, we have the Chelicerformes and now we have the Meristomata. Um, and um, I don't know why that red line is there. So let me see if I can make it disappear. Hopefully I edit that out because something happened to my pin, but we'll see. Sometimes I forget. I make these videos sometimes three or four weeks in advance because I'm right. I, I'm making the videos and I'm writing quizzes and, and then I forget. So I apologize, but you know, you get what you get. One of the, one of my sons, um, actually both kids, both my sons, when they were in preschool, they're not in preschool now, but you have these teaching moments and I'm a teacher. So I, I, I hone in on those things. And my kids both had a preschool teacher that taught them, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. That's it. It's like, hey, you know, you get the, the, the orange candy. You don't like the orange candy. That's what you get. And um, we still use it. To this day, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Um, but anyway, class Meristomata. Six pairs of appendages. And so when we look at the Meristomata, like horseshoe crabs you see here, um, one pair of chelicera, again, mouth parts, five pairs of walking legs. So six pairs total. Uh, no pedipalps. That's the five pairs of walking legs instead. So instead of having eight legs like a spider, they're going to have 10. They've been around a very, very long time, unchanged since the Triassic period. So in the fossil record, we see they've been around for a long time and they live on the shallow coast, mainly on the East Coast. And they use the sandy uh, bottoms to lay eggs. And uh, they're an interesting animal. They've been around for, you know, millions and millions of years. And now they're kind of getting endangered, unfortunately, because of habitat loss. And, and it's actually kind of depressing that they have made it all this way until we've come along. Um, they've survived everything pretty much except humans now. Anyway, they have a larva that is similar to the trilobite. Remember the trilobite's extinct. In lab, we have this... Um, we have this like plastic thing with a trilobite. Uh, well, it's a, it's a horseshoe crab larva inside this plastic mount and it says trilobite on it and it makes it look like, uh, we have the larva of a trilobite, but it is not, it is the trilobite, um, lookalike. It is the larva of this thing, but it looks like um, fossils of the trilobites, which are extinct, which we don't have the actual larva for, like you see in, uh, although it's labeled that way in lab. Okay. All right. Next, we have the Pycnogonida. Um, the Pycnogonida are the, what we call sea spiders. And the sea spiders are not true spiders. They look spider-ish, um, but they, they live in the ocean. They have extra 
duplicated body segments. They're not venomous um, and they live in uh, polar oceans, which means the extreme north or the extreme south. Um, and um, so they have all these extra legs in this very minimalistic uh, body and ocean dwelling thing. And again, not a true spider, but um, and there are many things like that, like the harvest men or the daddy long legs where they're also not pycnogonids, uh, but they are not spiders either. They just look spider-ish. So we call them, uh, they, they go along with those names. Then we get into the arachnida. The arachnida includes things like spiders and scorpions um, and um, ticks, which we'll talk about. And scorpions are probably the first of the groups uh, the terrestrial group of invertebrates to come on to land. Uh, they have pedipalps again, which is a mouth part, and those are modified in this case into pinchers. So crabs and lobsters have a pincher, which we'll get into more of the name of that later on. In a scorpion, that's actually a modified mouth part, and that's called a pedipalp. So although it's gonna look similar to what we see in crabs and lobsters, it's gonna be a different structure. Um, they, scorpions have a tail modified with a stinger. So they use it to sting their prey and immobilize it. Um, there's some myths that scorpions are super dangerous and the smaller they are, the more dangerous. And most of those are myths. There are some scorpions in the world that if you get stung, um, it can be quite bad. But in general, in the United States, um, unless you're highly allergic to scorpions, I don't know anyone that ever has been. Um, if you get stung by a scorpion, it's kind of like a bee sting for a regular person. So it's really not that venomous. Scorpions are not um, the ones we have locally here um, in general are not that venomous. There are some. I had a friend, I had a colleague in grad school. I studied snakes and lizards and he was studying scorpions and he had this really dangerous one from Africa and he dropped it and it got out and it's running down the hall and it's running at me and he wanted me to catch it and I just got out of its way because I don't work with scorpions and I don't know what this thing's going to do. Um, and he, my friend was mad at me because it ran under the door somewhere and I got it. Um, but that's not, I'm not going to grab uh, the dangerous African scorpion. But anyway, then we also have ticks and mites. Those are parasitic forms of arachnids as well. Uh, and then we have spiders and the spiders have chelicera, which are the mouth parts that are used uh, and modified into fangs to inject poison in them. And the spiders can also do things like produce silk, which you know about, and silk are used to make webs. But a lot of spiders don't make webs like you're used to seeing, but they can use that silk for other things like encasing eggs, um, escaping for predators. Uh, they'll do a thing called ballooning where they shoot out some silk and it catches the air and they kind of blow in the wind. So if you've ever been, um, if you've seen a flying spider, spiders don't fly, but they do this thing that they call, it's called ballooning. Um, and what they do with ballooning is they have the silk in the air and they can blow long distances. My son, when he was like two or three, uh, my youngest was freaking out. I heard him yelling outside and the spider was chasing him. He said it was flying and it's because, you know, the spider was being drugged. It, part of the silk got on him and as he ran, this thing was chasing him, he thought, um, but it wasn't. Um, anyway. And they use it for courtship and things of that sort also. Then we have the subphylum sub crustacea, which is a very big group, but mostly marine organisms. And in the crustacea, they do have antenna, but they have two pairs of antenna. And their appendages are biramous, which means they have two main branches to the appendages. Um, so instead of one branch, they'll have two. They also have mandibles, chewing mouth parts, and their body will consist of two or three parts. And most of these are marine. And we'll see most of those in lab. We'll talk about those. Then we have the subphylum Myriapoda. Uh, and the Myriapoda then um, 
can be broken down into um, other groups I'll show you in a second. But the Myriapoda uh, have one pair of antenna. So um, the crustaceans have two pair, like a lobster um, or a crab is a crustacean. Two pairs of antenna and the Myriapoda, Myriapoda have one pair of appendage and they're uniramous, they have one branch and they also have mandibles. Um, then within the Myriapoda, we have two classes. We have the Chilopoda, which are the centipedes and the Diplopoda, which are the uh, millipedes. So centipedes have one pair of jointed legs per body segment. Uh, they have a poisonous claw and they are predators. If you turn over a rock um, in your backyard, you can commonly find either a centipede or a millipede. The big joke, of course, as a kid is how many legs does a centipede have? And you look at it, it's got a hundred legs, which it doesn't, but that's not a bad guess. You know, if you count it, it might have close to, probably depends on the centipede. Some might have a hundred legs, but it's close. But since a centipede has a hundred legs, which is not right, um, millipedes, have a million legs, uh, which is way off. So um, millipedes have two pairs of jointed legs per body segment. Like you can see the two little legs there and there. So each one I might ask you that. That might be a good quiz question. Is how many legs does a millipede have? And if you say a million, you got to go back to like third grade or something like that. Anyway, that's Chilopoda and Diplopoda. Then we have the biggest group of them all, the subphylum hexapoda, class insecta, uh, or um, the insects. And this is the most diverse group of all the arthropods. And they were probably um, the cause of or related to the angiosperm diversity. So you might remember when we talked about plants and we talked about angiosperm diversity, you think of plants as being around for a long time, which many of them were, but the angiosperms, the flowering plants really started to take off at about the same time as the insects. So we think this is a good example of coevolution where one group influenced the other because you start to see a rapid evolution of insects the same time you see a rapid evolution of the angiosperms and many of them are pollinators for it. So it makes sense. Okay. They come in different forms of how they go through metamorphosis. There's actually three groups, but I'll just tell you about two of them here. Metamorphosis is where the body changes. It can be complete or it can be incomplete. Um, and so complete metamorphosis is like what you see here where you have a caterpillar type of thing. And then over time, that caterpillar eats and it does whatever it does as a caterpillar. And then it forms this cocoon and it changes its body. A lot of its body rearranges itself in there and it comes out like that. It comes out as a very different animal by rearranging and growing new body parts it didn't have before. That's a type of complete metamorphosis. Um, incomplete metamorphosis would be something like a grasshopper. A grasshopper comes out when it hatches out of the egg. It's like a little tiny miniature grasshopper. It looks like a grasshopper, but it's much smaller um, and it doesn't have its wings yet. And over time it grows and becomes a bigger grasshopper and eventually grows wings and then it becomes the complete grasshopper. So that's an incomplete metamorphosis. Now there are something like, uh, depends on how it would, depends on if you're a lumper or a splitter really, but there's something like 25 to 30 different, uh, orders of insects in lab. We're going to do something different. I'll explain how we do insect orders in lab in another video. But, um, here, what I want to point out, I, I want you to know certain, insects and remember these certain insects and their characteristics um, so that you're kind of aware of what it is. And here's part of the reason uh, why. To, to memorize all the orders is too overwhelming. 
There's too many of them. But your non-Bio2 friends, um, when you go outside and they find something, they're going to expect you to know what it is. Anything they find that's alive, here's this bug um, or here's this beetle or anything they find. And they're going to go, what's this? And if you go, well, I don't know, they're going to go like, aren't you a biology major? Like, how come you don't know that? And, and obviously, you know that you can't know everything because there's so many things that are out there. But your friends don't know that. Your friend, in your friend's world, there's 12 different things and you should know the 12 things. Um, so if you look at something and say it's an insect, they're like, you know, I knew that. So they think your education's worthless. So if you find a beetle, a ladybug, and they go, what's this? And you say, oh, that's a coleoptera. Coleoptera is the order the beetles are in. They have two pairs of wings. And most of the time, the front pair is very thickened into what are called elytra. So these big beetles here, the Japanese beetles, most beetles are like this, but they have this hard outer shell and they open it up and then their softer wings come out and they can fly. You tell your friends coleoptera and then they're going to think you're smart, like you know something new because they don't know the word coleoptera. If you said beetle, they know what a beetle is. So by knowing just the simple word coleoptera and a couple of characteristics, your friends now think you're a genius. Um, so we'll just do the big ones. And you notice right there, approximate number of species around 350,000. Again, we've been naming beetles longer than just about anything else. So if you had to pick um, an animal that's going to be the most common animal to find, especially if you're in a tropical forest somewhere, it's going to be a beetle. It's the most common identified animal on the planet in terms of identified species. Now, nematode worms, like I said before, if you really get into it, you might find more of those. So, coleoptera, okay? That's one. Um, so, the other two you don't need to know. Okay, so just the ones that I'm talking about, those for lecture, you need to memorize. For lab, we're gonna do a different thing. I'll explain that later, but for your lecture, quiz, and exam, and those sort of things, you just need to know the ones I'm going to talk about. Okay, the next uh, on this group, you need to know all three of these. And first we have the Diptera. Diptera are the flies. Most people know what a fly looks like. It has one pair of wings, not two. And the back pair, so it does have these back wings, but you can't see them anymore. They're called haltiers. So if you look under a microscope or if you have really good eyes, a fly will have like, these little knobs, that's not what I want to do. I have these little knobs that stick out. Those are even too big. Um, so it'll have one pair of wings, not two. Um, and it won't have a hard covering on the outside. And that's a fly. There are some flies that are really kind of interesting and tricky where they're black and yellow. Um, and they look like a bee or a wasp. But if you look closely at them, you can see they only have one pair of wings. Um, also, most flies have these really short antenna. So if you look at those two sort of features, um, even something that looks like a bee is probably a fly. So those are the diptera. The next is the hemipterans. And the hemipterans are what we call the true bugs. So there's the word bug that's used for anything that's small. And then there's actually a group of insects called the true bugs, the hemipterans. Um, and they have two pairs of wings, kind of like the beetles. And like the beetles, they have a harder outer layer to the wings, but only half of it is hard. So uh, like if you look here, this is a leaf footed bug. This is the hard part of the wing there. So they have these half hard wings, not full elytra, but sort of a half elytra. And you you might remember, it wasn't this particular one, uh, but it was one like this, the kissing bug. The kissing bug is a hemipteran. And what causes, what disease does the kissing bug cause? And you might be thinking, you know, 
but you don't because it's not the kissing bug that causes it. It's the um, trypanosoma that's inside the kissing bug, if you remember, causes Chagas disease. And so the vector for Chagas disease is a hemipterin. Just, you know, to refresh your memory from things long ago. They could come up on a final or something, just saying, you know. I make these things and you guys will write them down and then I won't remember them later on, but maybe I will. Anyway, then we have the Hymenoptera. The Hymenoptera are the bees, wasp, and ants. Um, they can be winged or they can be wingless. So ants don't have wings always. There are some ants with wings. Um, there are bees and wasps that have wings, but then there are some that don't. Um, so wings is kind of a hit or miss, but they have two pairs of wings that they have them and they have a very thin waist. So you look at this uh, cicada killer wasp and you see these body parts and right there, right there where the abdomen meets, there's this constriction. Uh, so they have and all the bees and all the hymenoptera and there's this part where it just gets real narrow where the abdomen meets the rest of the body. That's a characteristic of the hymenopterum. Then uh, you don't need to worry about the termites. Uh, the next group, the Lepidoptera, are butterflies and moths. Um, they have two sets of wings covered with scales that look like that. It's a pretty easy group to recognize. Um, because everybody knows what a butterfly or moth is, uh, but now you can call them Lepidoptera. Not a lot of difference really between a butterfly and a moth. Butterflies typically fly during the day and moths fly during the night, but other than that, they're kind of uh, the same, um, um, in the same order, uh, but different species. Nothing really separates them um, per se exactly. Then we have the Odonata, the Odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies, they also have two sets of wings, um, but they're really, they have a really long abdomen and they have really big wings and they have uh, two sets of membranous wings and they have really big compound eyes. They're, they're predators and they hunt other insects. Dragonflies, when they rest, they leave their wings out like that, um, as you can see splayed out damselflies, which are almost the same thing. They look identical. They fold their wings back. Um, but other than that, they look the same. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to do the phylum echinodermata in the next lecture, because I think that'll be a good place to uh, call it quits for now. I hope everyone's doing well and I will talk with you soon. Um, email me if you have questions come to my office hours. Um, we're getting down near the last half of the class and um, it's time to sort of push through the end, I think. Uh, I will talk with everybody soon. Hope you're doing well.